The first lesson is from Isaiah, chapter 50, verses 4 to 9a. The Lord God has given me the tongue of a teacher, that I may know how to sustain the weary with a word. Morning by morning he waken, wakens my ear. To listen to what, to, as those who are taught, the Lord God has opened my, and my ear, and I was not rebellious. I did not turn backwards. I gave my back to those who struck me, and my cheek to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from insult and spitting. The Lord God helps me, therefore I have not been disgraced. Therefore I have set my face like flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. Who, he who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who are my adversaries? Let them confront me. It is the Lord God who helps me, who will declare me guilty. The word of the Lord. The psalm is 116 verses 1 through 9. I love the Lord who has heard my voice and listens to my supplications. For the Lord has given ear to me whenever I call. The cords of death entangle me. The anguish of the grave come upon me. I come to grief and sorrow. And then I called, called upon, upon the name, name of the, of the Lord. Lord. O oh Lord, I pray you, save, save my, my life. life. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. The Lord watches over the innocent. I was brought low, and God saved me. Turn again to your rest, O oh my soul, for the Lord has dealt well with you. For you have rescued my life from death, my eyes from tears, and my feet from stumbling. I will walk in the presence of the Lord in the land of the living. The second reading is James chapter 3, verses 1 to 12. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers and sisters, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For all of us make many mistakes. Anyone who makes no mistakes in speaking, it, in speaking is perfect able to keep the whole body in check with the bridle. If we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we guide their whole bodies. Or look at the ship though, they are so large that it takes strong winds to drive them, yet they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tug is a small member, yet it boasts of great exploits. How great a force is set ablaze by a small fire, and the tongue is a fire. The tongue is placed among our members as a world of iniquities. It stains the whole body set on fire the cycle of nature and is itself set on fire by hell for every species and beast and bird of reptile and sea creatures can be tamed and has been tamed by the human species but no one can tame the tongue a restless evil full of deadly poison with it we bless the Lord and Father, 
and with it we curse those who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth came blessing and cursing. My brothers and sisters, it not, ought not to be so. Does a spring pour, spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and brackish water? Can a fig tree from brothers and sisters Get a fig tree, my brothers and sisters, yields olive or a grapevine figs. No more can salt water yield fresh. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Shall we go? Oh, you, you have, have the words, words of, of eternal life. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! The Holy Gospel according to Mark, the eighth chapter. Praise to you, O Lord. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered, you are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind on things or you are not, I'm sorry, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, if any wants to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in glory of the Father." with the holy angels, the word of the Lord. Praise to you, o Christ. Please be seated. I don't think we have any little people with us today, sadly. Um, we'll look forward to them in the future. Uh, also, uh, quick reminder that uh, we if you haven't already signed up for the uh, for the leadership retreat if you're on council uh, we will need you to do that and also there are buns I don't know did they mention that the buns that are out there on near the office door there are lots of hot dog buns and some hamburger buns so please take them with you if you would uh, I um, thought about this scripture text from the gospel this week, and I, I went ahead and scribed the sermon on Tuesday, and then I kept thinking, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. You know, sometimes you wrestle, you wrestle with what it is that God wants to say on Sunday morning. And uh, I had something happen to me yesterday that I thought was interesting. A, a friend came to me with a dilemma. They had purchased a, an item from a local merchant and the item was incorrect and uh, so they had 
called the merchant up and said, you know, this item that you gave me was incorrect and, and, and uh, it broke and I would like to know if you could either refund my money or replace it with the correct thing. And the merchant said no for whatever reason. They said no. And uh, so what, as this person was talking to me, I was curious about well, why, a, why a merchant would do that knowing that good business always fosters more business and why if you're... Uh, if your customer is unhappy, you wouldn't do something to try to make them happy with your product. You know, offer them something. That's what well, I was always taught in business. You know, you offer them some kind of a, a carrot or a, a consolation or something. But apparently this person was perhaps having a bad day. I don't know. And instead of consoling my friend and saying, oh, I'm so sorry that happened to you. That wasn't right. Um, is there anything I can do to help you? I queried about the merchant. I said, you know, why would a merchant do that? That doesn't make sense. Well, the person really was deeply offended that I wasn't showing concern or compassion for the, and they got very angry and upset. And I read this scripture text from James and I thought, oh, the tongue is a little fire just getting ready to start a forest fire, you know, or a little spark getting ready to start a forest fire. And uh, so yesterday, I guess that was what happened to me. So, uh, Unfortunately, there's a sermon there that you may hear it another day because I feel like the Lord wants us to talk about the gospel message, which is, who do you say that I am? Uh, which is my title, who is Jesus to you? Uh, my family sat around the dinner table a few years ago with uh, one of my son's young friends by the name of Mark and um, he had agreed to stay for dinner after some coaxing. He was he's kind of a little shy and I just didn't want to impose, I suppose. But um, Mark's a very quiet kind of fellow that struggles a little socially interacting with other people. So near the end of the meal, I asked him if his family ever attended church. And he said, no, they weren't very regular attenders, but he said he had a, an uncle who was a pastor. And I said, oh, oh my goodness. And uh, so I followed that with a few questions. Finally, I said to him uh, in, in uh, response to all that conversation, well, Mark, to you, who is Jesus Christ? And uh, my son shot me an ugly look like, why are you grilling my friends on their religious beliefs? <laughs> But Mark surprised me. He instantly responded in a very confident tone and said, Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. At that moment, I thought about this passage from the book of Mark, and I thought that's how Peter responded when Jesus wanted to know, who do you say that I am? So uh, Peter is confident. There are lots of misconceptions, though, about who Jesus really is in this world. And we know that by the way some people respond to the name of Jesus, or should I say use the name of Jesus, and it's not usually in reference to his, his uh, being praised or his uh, honor, it's other ways. So when Jesus asked some of the disciples to tell him, who do the people say that I am? They told him John the Baptist was the first thing out of their mouth. And, you know, that's really not too surprising when you consider that John and Jesus in the physical were cousins. So there's a possibility that God had created them both very similar in appearance. Uh, and we also know that Herod thought at one point that uh, Jesus was John the Baptist come back from the dead because he had beheaded John uh, simply to fulfill a, a request and then regretted it and was afraid that this person, Jesus, was John the Baptist, come back to haunt him. So we have these misconceptions about who Jesus was. And uh, some people said he was Elijah. You remember the transfiguration on the mount. There was, there was uh, some beings there that Peter and the other two disciples saw. Elijah... And he, he was there with Moses. And so here we have these great prophets that Jesus was sometimes confused with because he did amazing miracles. So at this point, Jesus then asked them very directly with emphasis on the word you, but who do you say that I am? 
Peter, like my friends Mark, boldly says, you are the Messiah. In Jewish uh, pronunciation in the Hebrew language, they would say, you are the Messiah. And uh, kind of with a guttural sound on the end. Or you are the Christ. In Greek, the word Christ and in Hebrew, the word Messiah both mean the anointed one. And uh, perhaps you all know this already, but by saying that someone it was anointed, it meant that you recognize that person as a divinely chosen leader who uh, the people generally, a king or a, a royal person, a king who would be an agent of God to restore Restore the people or bring about restoration to the end or to the uh, conclusion of whatever they had come to save. Peter is saying that they recognized Jesus as a divinely appointed leader destined to bring restoration. But the problem was that the Jews were waiting for a Messiah that would be a religious political person who would deliver them from the Roman rule and from the occupation of this foreign body of people and give victory to the nation of Israel as it had been given in years of old by other kings. Jesus didn't come though to bring political domination. Jesus came to bring salvation. He came to bring personal salvation and through his suffering and death, he made that happen. That was, as we know, very hard for people to understand at the time. Mark presents us with a savior who is the suffering servant. Isaiah 53 describes him that way by saying, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Uh, you know, sometimes we don't see paintings of Jesus as the savior who is acquainted with grief. Um, you all know people who have suffered terribly in their lifetime. They're not usually all big smiles, although some are real overcomers and they smile in the face of all that they've been through. Uh, I believe that our Lord smiled at people, uh, but I believe that for the disciples, they knew the agony that he sometimes experienced. Isaiah goes on to say, and we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Uh, you know, when we don't stick up for friends, that's kind of what's going on. Um, if they get somebody picking on them, being a bully, being uh, unfair to them, and if we don't stick up for them, uh, that's exactly what Jesus was going through. He knew that agony. So the disciples do not understand the suffering that suffering lies at the heart of Jesus' mission. And yet, because of the transfiguration and the miracles of healing and the deliverance done by Jesus and the powerful way Jesus confronted sin and evil, they could see he was not any ordinary prophet or individual. He dealt with evil in a way no one had been able to, to deliver people, demonically deliver them from demonic forces. You don't need to be brilliant to see the power of God as you read the scriptures and you hear about God's love in the person of Jesus. It's, it's magnificent. It changes lives. It makes people so different. I was sharing this week as I was getting my hair cut about some family members I have whose lives have been turned completely around 180 degrees from what they were when they were young because they came to Jesus and humbled themselves and asked Jesus to become their Lord and Savior. Um, those are the kind of things we need to be sharing if we are a believer in Christ. Uh, recently, third and fourth graders at Wheaton, Illinois Christian Grammar School were asked to complete the following sentence. By faith, I know that God is blank. And uh, one little girl, Amanda, says, I know by faith that God is forgiving because he forgave in the Bible and he forgave me when I went in the road on my bike without my parents. Okay, so she understands that somehow that God has forgiven her. Uh, the next one I thought was really cute, Brandon. 
He said, God is providing full. Uh, so uh, he says, because he dropped manna for Moses and the people, and he gave my dad a job. Sometimes uh, kids are so precious, they understand that that's a blessing from the Lord. Uh, the next one was also a little boy, Paul. And he said, uh, by faith, I know that God is caring because he made the blind see, the blind man see, and he made me catch a very fast line drive that could have hurt me. He probably sent an angel down. And then uh, here's another little boy by the name of Jeremy. And Jeremy says, by faith, I know that God is merciful because my brother has been nice to me for a whole year. And uh, two more. Uh, here's one that is anonymous. Uh, by faith, I know that God is faithful because the school bill came and my mom didn't know where, how we were going to pay. Two minutes later, my dad called and he just got a bonus check. And he says, my mom was in tears. And then finally, the last one's from a little girl named Hannah. She says, by faith, I know that God is sweet because he gave me a dog. God tells me not to do things that are bad. I need someone like that. <laughs> Don't we all need someone like that? Uh, someone to tell us that we uh, should not do things that are bad. It is the personal faith we step out on that allows us to know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And to have the freedom to give our burdens to God. Um, I had a pamphlet I used to pass out. I'll have to see if I can get some more of them there. It's a little pamphlet. It's called Overcoming Worry. And in the pamphlet, uh, there's a story about a girl by the name of Joni Yoder. We have a lot of Yoders in this area with all the Amish. Um, but she uh, gives a life-altering account of learning to trust the Lord uh, not as a last resort, but as a first response to trouble in her life. And I love this little book. I'll, I'll see if I can find it. But she said, the answer is not in what we do, but in what we believe. Uh, I was listening to NPR yesterday, and they were, had a fellow in there talking about how gratitude changes your whole demeanor in life. And he, he has written in lectures around uh, all over about this gratitude. He was saying it begins by being thankful for what is right in front of you. Maybe the wood in the pew that was made by somebody who wanted to be honoring God, you know, or, or who knows, the, the pads on the pew, the beautiful red carpeting that somebody played for. Just what is right, the shirt you wear, the pearl buttons on your shirt, or what, whatever. And sometimes we look at those little bitty things right where we are, and we can be overwhelmed with gratitude and awe at the wonderful things we have at our disposal. Rather than being overwhelmed with all the troubles and cares of this world, uh, that not to be dismissive of those cares, but sometimes an attitude of gratitude just changes everything about life. Uh, in this uh, girl's words, uh, Joni Yoder, she said, the answer is not in what we do, but what we believe. If we believe that Jesus is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, we will find the wisdom and strength we need in reading, praying, trusting, obeying. That's a great phrase that I think everybody should have in their mind. Reading, praying, trusting, obeying. We will struggle in an endless battle for true freedom until we understand that all our righteousness is as filthy rags Yes, we want to persevere and try to walk a walk of holiness, but all our efforts for self-promotion will be futile unless we give it to the Lord uh, we, and be obedient to where he leads. We need to practice sharing our personal testimonies and walking that walk. Last night I was asked to give the invocation at the Bridgeport High School's alumni banquet, their uh, Hall of Fame recognition, etc., and I, as I sat there, I was just amused. I was amused because uh, 
Mr. Zitzelberger was in the audience, uh, the former uh, principal. Some of you know him. Some of you may have worked under him. But uh, Mr. Zitzelberger uh, is a great Christian guy. He loves the Lord. And uh, he, uh, he did his best to do a good job as principal over there. And yet when I came to him after subbing for them for like seven years and said, I know the art job's open. I have a master's degree in art education. Could I please have the job? He said, no. And I said, why not? Am I that bad a sub? And he said, no, you have a master's degree. And frankly, I am not going to hire somebody at that pay level. I'm going to have to hire somebody at a lower level because we got really tight finances right now. And he said, I'm sorry. But even as he told me that, I could feel the Holy Spirit saying, this is not where I want you. This is not what I have for you. I have something else. And I even told him that. I said, you know, I keep feeling like God is telling me to go to seminary, but I don't even know if I agree with women in the pulpit. And he said, you know, I have a relative who is a pastor. And he said, I think you would do fine at that. And I think he was very sincere. I don't think he was at all trying to make me feel better because he had to tell me no. I think because as a Christian, he understood we have to be obedient to what God's calling us to do. And sometimes it's hard. It some, sometimes calls us to a walk of suffering and difficulty. Uh, I just admire so much Patty. I watch her sometimes as she's taking care of the, all the pews, uh, taking care of all the little things you do when you, I, I don't know the name of what you Lutherans call that when you come in and take care of all the offering cards and all of that. Um, but I watch her sometimes from the back and, and it just blesses my heart to see somebody's taking time out of their day, no matter how they feel, to serve the Lord. So many of you were here yesterday. I, you know, I had somebody not part of the church say to me yesterday, man, this church has a lot of workers. And I thought, isn't that beautiful? So many of you, even though there's not a lot of us right now, all come and put all hands on deck when there is a need for service. Thank you so much. And that's at the heart of who do you say that Jesus is. As we practice our faith, as we trust God to lead us in the direction that he wants to lead us, as we yield to him, even in difficulty, that's when we begin to say how Jesus is real to us, who Jesus is to us, and what he means. If Jesus is just a concept, a religious practice, you take or leave, or just some historical figure that you entertain once a week in a pew in church, you will never know the power and freedom of the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is incredible relationship available to us through Christ that gives us access to that power and freedom. Jesus lived a sinless life. I really believe that. Some people don't. They think Jesus, you know, was a guy. He was just a, like any other guy. Uh, I believe he lived a sinless life. He suffered and died and paid our price because he was qualified to do that. And none of us really are. And we are very often very casual about the person of Jesus. I had a friend in Pittsburgh who used to hate it when people just called him Jesus. She said, he is Jesus Christ. He is not just some other Jesus, you know, the Hispanics name their kids Jesus or Jesus. She said, she said, we don't just call people Jesus or call him Jesus. We call him Jesus Christ. Well, I think that's a little picking at straws, but, but uh, I, her point was don't be casual about the sacredness of our Lord and Savior. Jesus said, whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what will it profit a person if they gain the whole world but lose their own soul? Who is Jesus to you? Is Jesus someone you love? If you love him, what do you respond to that with? If you want to think about who Jesus is and you're not sure, feel free to call me, talk to me, visit me. I'm in the office, usually Tuesday mornings, all day Wednesday. Uh, you can get a hold of me anytime on my phone number. 
uh, I'd love to talk to you. And we have some elders that are highly qualified, deep in their faith, that would be happy to share with you if you have any questions. Is Jesus someone you are excited about having a relationship with? Or is it Jesus is just some other topic I'd rather not think about? Someone that's made a difference in who you are today? I hope so. And if so, I hope you share that with others on a regular basis. I know a few of you do. I wish all of you would have the courage to do that. Hold on to that and nurture it, whatever that story is. But know that God is calling you to be able to be accountable, to take up your cross, and to follow Jesus in the kingdom of God for eternal peace. Amen.